transgression His love endures forever For the life that's been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Forever God is faithful Forever God is strong Forever God is Hey friends, so we mentioned that uh, come January, we let you know what our plan is as far as going online and whatnot. We wanted to give you the update that we uh, as a board have decided it's in our best uh, wisdom right now to continue to stay online for the month of January, but uh, we'll reassess again in February. Now the good news is there's a vaccine on the already in Jackson. So hope is here and we're excited to get back to things when the time comes, but at least at the time being, uh, it still seems best since we all don't have that vaccine to continue to stay online. With that being said, I know that getting community is one of the hardest elements when it comes to doing church online. So I just encourage you, strongly encourage, make comments, type to one another, embrace whatever form of community you can at this time. And if you want more community than what we offer in the this one hour uh, service every Sunday evenings, 5.30 to 9 o'clock is a lot of community-driven stuff through Nerd Church. Even if you don't want to play games, you can just join the Discord Nerd Church conversation and just chat with people. And then Jackson Cloud is meant to create community too. JXNCloud.com. Go there, join the Discord, talk about the videos, get to know one another, and create community in a time where that's difficult. So we will reassess again in February. Thank you for being patient with us and exercising caution with us. And we will continue to do our best to read the situation as time moves on. Thanks. I won't forget 
the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the Guiding light to my feet You found me, you freed me Held back the waters from my release Oh Yahweh You're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory Hallelujah, hallelujah You have taught
Isaiah 10 is a challenging prophetic word, and it's kind of symbolic of many of the prophetic words. So when we read this one, we're reading a lot of the prophets. He says, Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees, and the writers who keep writing oppression, to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil, that they may make the fatherless their prey. What will you do on the day of punishment, in the ruin that will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help, and where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains but to crouch among the prisoners or fall among the slain. For all this his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation I send him. Against the people of my wrath I command him to take spoil and seize plunder, to tread down, tread them down like the mire of the streets. Now, the doom and gloom does go on, but there's enough to pause there. It's strange what God does right here. Israel is known as God's people, and yet in Isaiah 10, Assyria is now seen as a tool of God. It's as though they're 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 just like uh, a hammer. Like God needs a tool to do something, and so He picks up Assyria to use them as that tool. Assyria is going to conquer and bring um, Israel into exile. And from like an outside standpoint, people might be thinking, "Oh, yeah, Assyria just got so rich and powerful, and they overtook us." Yeah, there's par partially that's that's true, but part of the reason Isaiah is saying that they're going to conquer Israel is because God's going to let them. God's using them as a tool against Israel. And that's hard. That's hard because we always want to be God's chosen people. And Israel, they are God's chosen people. So it's especially hard for them when God's like, you know that other nation out there? I'm going to use them against you. That's difficult. And whenever we hear like a really tough word like that, one of the things that we have to ask is, is why? God, why would, why would you do that? The answer Isaiah gave right from the beginning of this passage is because you're not taking care of the poor. Yeah, there's other reasons we've gone over in Isaiah as well, but the one here in Isaiah 10, you're not taking care of the poor. You're not taking care of a widow. You're not taking care of the orphan, of the fatherless. And in fact, you're making life more difficult for them. It's interesting the way it starts out. Those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression. There's almost this feeling of like legality right there. As though systemic problems are written into their own like legal jargon. That's keeping people in poverty. That's making widows be abused. That's making orphans be abused. Things are happening to them because of these decrees and the writing down of oppression. And that that happens if we're not paying attention, right? I mean, we just uh, had Pastor Jeffrey Harold uh, from our church in Washtenaw County in the Free Methodist uh, Conference. He, for our entire conference, gave a series of videos showing us like something like racism. Here's systemic racism. Here's all the legal rules that have been written down over the like decades that were put in place to keep racism alive. Now, sure, we might have like written out these words of racism now, but some of those rules live on in their ideology, even if they're not explicitly showing that they're racist and just looking at what the rules were show us today like as we look at certain social like situations we're like oh we can see how these rules created much of the different kind of systemic racism that we see today see we even as americans should be able to understand this that our iniquitous decrees and our writing oppression we have that in our own rules. And sometimes it's not intentional. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. Like I think of uh, uh, people I've met in poverty who are dealing with poverty. I think of uh, how they can't always get out for legal reasons. It's as though 
legalities keep them in poverty. Um, I've heard people be like, I can't get a job. You know, people are always like, oh, homeless people, if they just got a job, they'd be fine. I hear from homeless people or people in deep poverty who are like, I can't get a job. If I get a job, I will make less money because businesses pay less money than the government is willing to give people who uh, are are unable to, to find a job. And if you get a job and now you make less money, you're also paying for more bills, right? I mean, now you've got, well, I can't stay home and take care of my kids, so I have to get a babysitter for them so that I can go work a job to make less money and then not be able to pay my bills and then maybe have to become even like more impoverished than I am or end up homeless. Like, It's a cycle of legalities that actually end up messing you up. Maybe one of the ways in which some of you experience this is Maybe you don't make a lot of money, but you're like right in one of those tax brackets, like right on the edge of the bottom of the next tax bracket where you're taxed the same amount as someone way above you. And like it does so much more damage to you than it does to another person. Like that's an example, perhaps a more like common example of legalities like affecting you differently and sustaining difficulty for you where it wouldn't for someone else. And so when we see these kinds of things that happen, like God has an eye on those things. He understands like our nations and our societies and our legal systems and our systemic problems, like this all creates bad social situations for people who are oppressed and going through difficult times. Uh, so for God, I like to think of it from like a throne of God perspective. God's on the throne and all these prayers keep coming in. I don't know, angels delivering them. So uh, here's one from uh, Jamin Bradley, Jackson, you know, just kidding. God's receiving all of these prayers. And as he files through all the prayers, he recognizes, wow, there is a line here that if you just followed it, you would see that all of the orphans, all the fatherless, they have the same prayer. All of the widows, they have the same prayer. They're all asking for the same thing. What is it that's creating this problem in which they're all praying the same exact prayers and undergoing the same exact hardship? Well, God knows the answer to that. And in this particular case in Isaiah, he looks at, uh, he looks at um, Israel and says, you guys are the problem. You're the one doing this. I've read the lines. I've looked at the data. You guys are creating the problems among your poor. And you need to stop. And they're not the only nation that God says that to. I think of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, we often think of that as related to the whole scenario with Lot and all that, right? But that's not the only scenario that is put forward. Actually, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16 says, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. Sodom and Gomorrah had a lot and did not take care of those who had none among them. And so, part of their sin was not just all this scenario happening back in Genesis, but it's also that they had a lot and they didn't take care of those among them. That sounds like any wealthy nation, that once we all end up with a lot, we end up with a lot of poor and impoverished people. And for Sodom and Gomorrah, they faced a fiery judgment from God. And... God now faces, puts a different kind of judgment on Israel. You've done this too, and now you'll face your own kind of judgment. Uh, the spiritual beings that have messed up, the false gods who don't follow God anymore, one of the ways in which they're judged and told that they're no longer going to be immortal is that they didn't give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. They didn't rescue the needy. And they didn't deliver people from the hand of wicked people. Because of that, the false gods will face judgment. That's the same for humanity. 
humanity, like I'm always expecting in the Gospels when Jesus is like, all right, I separated the sheep from the goats. And people are like, well, what made us a sheep and what made us a goat? I'm always expecting Jesus to be like, well, these ones believed and these ones didn't. But that's not what he says. Instead, Jesus says, well, these ones took care of the poor, the oppressed, the needy, the prisoners, the naked, the sick, the hungry, the thirsty, and these ones didn't. Now, we know that it's our faith that saves us. But apparently, faith is so synonymous with taking care of the poor and the needy and the oppressed that if you have faith, you will do these things because it is the same thing. I mean, how far does God have to go to make that point, right? He himself, he's like, I'm going to put on human flesh. And he's the God of the universe. He could be born as a prince in a palace and just rise up to power and take over that way. But instead, he's born homeless inside of a stable, born in a feeding trough. We just celebrated this for Christmas, right? And then shortly after, his life is threatened with this kind of like, late-term abortion of sorts. Yes, he's been born, but like someone doesn't want him there, and so he should face these charges of simply being alive and therefore should be killed. And then he goes on from there to become a refugee, having to flee political oppression to find asylum in, in Egypt. And then from there, he probably lives in some kind of poverty. You know, refugees don't usually just suddenly become wealthy and when he finally gets home he's probably judged by his neighbors because they're thinking this isn't the son of god he wasn't a miracle either mary cheated on her fiance or uh her fiance got her pregnant before they got married and so he's probably disenfranchised by the assumptions of his neighbors and from there on out, he, he's going to go on to continue living in a homeless kind of way because he tells people, like, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, right? He's just a traveling vagabond with the disciples. Yeah, he's got some money because Judas was a treasurer, though so look at how that worked out for him. But he goes around preaching, like, money's, like, he preaches against materialism, against capitalism, against consumerism, against, like, stuff, Instead, tells people to give away all their money and to take care of the poor with it. Sell their stuff and take care of the needy instead. He lives a life of poverty. He does a ministry of poverty. And he reaches those in poverty. He eats food with the disenfranchised, with the tax collectors who were robbers. Like straight up, they just robbed people of their money and they did it legally. That's one of the things we're talking about here. You know, like legal rules to get away with crimes, right? Uh, he eats with prostitutes, he eats with the poor, he eats with those who, who like to eat as well, perhaps, because they don't have food where they are. Whatever the case may be, Jesus spends all of his time with the very people that God has always had his eye on. He loves them, he cares for them. And though they often are probably praying prayers that say, God, don't you care about me, don't you see me? The truth is, God has never stopped looking at them to the point that he himself puts on flesh, becomes like one of them, deals with all of their problems himself in his own life, and then goes on to, to die on a cross as a political prisoner given a death sentence. He goes through unjust treatment, just like... Um, people who have been given the death penalty but actually never did the crime that they were accused of. That was Jesus. Man, there's so many different themes of, of injustice, of injustice that come up in Jesus' own life and story. There are so many themes of people who are belittled and at the bottom of the social ladder that come up in Jesus' life that he himself goes through. Like, how loud... <laughs> How loud does God have to scream to get our attention on topics like this? He screamed it through the prophets and we killed them. And then he screamed it with his life and we killed him. And now for those of us who follow him, he's still screaming it and sometimes we're not listening. These aren't new topics. These are old 
topics. And I just look back at the last few years and I think of stories like refugees trying to break and get get into our country, rather whether that be legally or not. And then I look at our reactions where we take their children and we lock them up in cages. That right there is the kind of thing where God's like, hey, that's the kind of thing that I put judgment on. That's a legality type thing. That's a systemic type thing. That's something where we need to repent and be rebuked for stuff like that. That's messed up. And we have to say it like it is, especially as Christians. Yeah, this isn't a Christian nation. I get that. But like, if we are to be Christians and we are to be a prophetic voice to the nations to say, this is not okay by God's standards uh, to treat people this way. Uh, you know, I think of uh, even things like Black Lives Matters. Like, all the fights that I watched throughout the year online were so much about the organization Black Lives Matters. When so many people aren't even referencing that when they say Black Lives Matters. They're just using the term as a term for the oppressed to say that black lives do indeed matter to God and to me. And therefore, I will care for these lives. And yet, so many, even probably especially in the Christian realm from what I've seen, are fighting over between using that as a slogan and the organization. And these are not like that. We should be able to agree. Racism is bad. It's wrong and that black lives matter. And you, you can, you know, try to figure out how deep into the conversation you need to have between organization and slogan. Um, but none of us should have to fight about racism still existing in different ways, about systemic racism still existing, and about the importance that when we find it, we as Christians need to stop it. And the importance of, if we're going to stop it, opening our ears to listen, how we're going to do that and how we're guilty of it. That's why this year we had a lot of things like um, going through The Color of Compromise, a book by Jamar Tisby, where we got together for a month and watch different videos learning about how racism is prevalent. And, you know, there were some who were just so moved by that series saying, I have never heard this or noticed this before, and I cannot live the same way when I leave here. That's the prophetic at work in us, where God speaks a prophetic message about people who are belittled, and we listen, and we change. And God, unfortunately, doesn't see a lot of uh, the narratives throughout the prophetic words, he doesn't see a lot of times where people change. Like Nineveh, Nineveh is kind of rare. Jonah goes to Nineveh, says, here's how you messed up, and they change. If God got that every time, the world would be a better place. But God often does not get that. And so we keep falling deeper into our problems. And so if we were to take care of Jesus then we take care of the poor. If we are to be Christians, then we take care of those around us who are belittled and struggling. That's what I love about Dinner Church, right? Uh, yes, Dinner Church brings in people across all kinds of spectrums, be it um, socio or economic spectrums. But it also reaches a lot of people who just need food because they don't know where else to get it. And that's been my desire for so long, you know, to reach to reach people like that. And that doesn't always go perfectly. You know, Jesus doesn't promise that when you reach the poor, it will go perfectly. As I've served among the poor over the years, I've been cursed out. I've been um, manipulated. <laughs> a lot of things have gone wrong. I drove uh, someone home once who I then realized was too high to know where they lived and then got angry with me, and I got nervous about them being in my car. I I drove one guy around just to one place real quick and couldn't get him out of my car for two or three hours, and and uh, I th think he tried to steal my car at one point. I don't know, it's very confusing. Like It doesn't always go well, but Jesus didn't promise that. He simply said, you take care of such people. 
And so that's that's what we do. Even Jesus, you know, he eats dinner with so many people across the poor spectrum and the belittled spectrum. But it doesn't say, and then every time he left the meal, everyone got saved. It doesn't say that. Because that probably wasn't the case. People were probably really touched, really blessed, and uh, in that moment had an experience with God because they had an experience with Jesus and because they saw that God in flesh cared for them, and therefore God himself must care for them. But it didn't always probably go the way that Jesus would hope for it to go on his way out the door when dinner was over. Probably just wasn't the case. But results are not always the case. Sometimes it's about are we willing to love and live and be among the poor, regardless of what the outcome will be after having done so. And when we do that, we'll see so many powerful stories, uh, stories of poor people who don't have much food but are making food for friends, stories of poor people who in times of difficulty are making food for their enemies, the people who have been difficult with them and have been a, a, a thorn in their side. I've heard stories like that, stories of like the guy that I stopped on the side of the road, I was like, hey, I've got a bunch of leftover food from our food drive. Would you like any? I see you've already got a shopping cart here full of tons of other food. And him saying like, ooh, yeah, you know, I'll take these things. But that, you know, someone else might need that more. You're, you're homeless. You are the one who needs it more. Yeah, why don't you say it for someone else? You know how often I run into that? Now, often poor people are getting involved in acts of service to take care of others around them and are volunteering at places where, where volunteers are especially needed. That happens all the time. Very generous. Even with giving, they might, like the woman that Jesus saw who gave a penny. A penny! And Jesus is like, she gave the most money. She needed that penny. That penny counted more than it does for anyone else, and yet she gave it away. And yet us, we've all got like something in our mind as to how much is too much, right? Like uh, over twenty, I gotta, I gotta think about it. Over forty, I gotta think about it. You know, it's different for everyone. But this woman's like, I got a penny. It's all I got. Here you go, God. You know, sometimes it's the poor that are much closer to God than I am, <laughs> than you might be. I think of. Uh, uh, I, I was at a, a Project Homeless Connect where we meet with homeless people and then try to plug them into the organizations that can help them. This guy comes up to me like, yeah, I pastor this church, 1208 Greenwood. And he starts like reciting the Bible to me. Like he's just, he's gotten really interested in Jesus and he's been reading it and memorizing it. And he knows so much more than I do. <laughs> I'm like, dude, <laughs> like... Wow, man, you you just been devouring this thing. I wish I had that kind of passion. I think of someone that I went and I, I knocked on the windows like, hey, I'm bringing by pop cans. I know that uh, you like to turn these in if I bring them by. And the windows are all fogged up. They're sleeping inside of it. And as they open the door, it's like, oh, it's a pastor. Didn't know you were going. Yeah, I was just reading my Bible. Oh. I wish that someone would interrupt me just reading my Bible inside of a car as I'm trying to get by. Like, these are the kind of stories that come too. It's not always just like I feel like someone cursed me out or I was manipulated. There's always these sides of like, wow, I need you to be an inspiration in my life so that I would be a better Christian like you are. When we serve the poor, we serve Jesus. And that's why we don't like when we do dinner church, we hope not to make just like food that people can eat, something edible. Because I wouldn't do that for Jesus. You know, if you stop by my house, and we're like, oh, Jesus, let me, uh, I got some Cheez Its. You got some Cheez Its? No, like, oh, you want to stay for dinner? I'll cook up some chicken carbonara. What do you want? You know, like, that's, that's exactly what we're doing when we serve food, when we're serving the poor. We're feeding Jesus. He literally said that himself. The least, uh, whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done for me. So what do you do for the least of these? And does it look like what you would do for Jesus? Like this is a big discussion. Taking care of the poor is a national conversation. It's a personal conversation. 
and it's a communal conversation, a church conversation, a city conversation, like it's on so many levels. And Isaiah himself recognizes even here that it starts at the top with Israel. How are my people taking care of the nations? That starts at the top with Sodom and Gomorrah. How are my people taking care of their nations? That starts with the top with the little G gods that were supposed to take care of the nations. How are you taking care of the nations? And when those answers are were not, then the fiery judgment is the result or the judgment of Assyria taking over. Yeah, I'll end with this story. Uh, John Mark McMillan, my favorite artist, uh, he wrote a song called Borderlands. And he says that sometimes songs grow on you over time. And this particular song he was playing on the borderland. There he was uh, playing the song at a concert and he could see Mexico from where he was standing. Like he was right on the border. And as he played that song, it just it got to him. He came across a road even called Borderland Road. And as he thought over all these themes about seeing the sign Borderland Road, about playing a song on the border, he remembered that a picture had just surfaced in the previous weeks or months of, uh, of a, a man and his daughter trying to get to the States, become refugees. And they died on the way. They wash up on shore. Just how painful and unsettling a picture like that is. And the song just kind of broke him that night. And eventually he thought of a statement that a, a friend had, had made uh, saying, um, you know, we always think that we're David, but we never think that we're Goliath. We always think that we're conquering giants, not that we're the giants that need to be conquered. And that is a question that any nation that has wealth and power, especially more than others, needs to ask. Because if we're always framing our lives in the story of, are we the giant today? Then maybe for a minute we would stop and repent and say, what we're doing here is wrong. And today... If we're going to be the giant conqueror, then we need to like step back, repent of the wrongs that we're doing, and do good. That we need to fight to change certain legalities. That we need to take care of the poor and impoverished, not only from the top, but from the bottom, from our personal lives, on all scales. So that's the encouragement to you today. What we do matters. And sometimes when you're taking care of the poor, that feels like maybe one of the like least impactful things you're sometimes going to feel like you're doing. Like I'm taking care of one person at a time. And it's hard and it's difficult and it's a slow progress just trying to find someone a house to move into. That's it's hard. But when you're doing those things, you are doing the biggest things that there is to do in the kingdom of heaven. You're storing up treasure in heaven. You're saying, forget about the treasure right now. All I care about is, is doing what God calls me to do. And there's reward in that. So, with all that being said, take care of those around you. Uh, and let's continue as a church to make sure that that is a primary goal of the kind of things that we care about, simply because we care about Jesus. In the spirit of the Lord.